right, team, Coach Dana Cavalier here with the Becoming a Champion Show. And today I sat down with Dawn Kelly, the CEO and president of Barney Butter. And if you guys haven't tasted Barney Butter, it's amazing. It's the best almond butter on the market. I have it every day. It's amazing. So after tasting it, I said, who created this? Who runs this company? I have to find her. And I did. And it's Dawn Kelly. And we had a great, great conversation. I hope you sit back and enjoy it. Take some notes because this is a good one. And you're going to learn a lot about what it takes to bring a product to market, the mindset, the attitude, the heart, the passion you have to have. So enjoy today's episode with Dawn Kelly. I know you're going to love it. And if you do, give us a thumbs up, give us a like, and put your comments down below. So I'm excited to have you today. And, and you know, when we spoke last time, I said, you know, my wife and I are just really big fans of, of the product. And uh, we always have a stash of Barney butter ready to go. And, um, you know, whenever I come across products that, that I enjoy, that I find stand out from the rest, my first question is, okay, who's behind this? So, <laughs> so that's, um, that's why I wanted to, to talk to you today. So when, when you, um, did you start Barney butter? Uh, no, not in the very beginning. We okay. didn't actually start it we came on as investors very early on okay um, we always say that while we didn't give birth to barney butter we you know adopted it and raised it from a small baby so um we're in our 11th year now wow. doing this and so um yeah it's a totally different company than it was when we got involved and came on as investors so long ago but um we've been here for the whole ride and it's been so much fun yeah, and it's a great product, as as you said. I mean, it kind of um, sells itself, I guess. Like once people actually try our product, it's one of the few products I think you know on the on the shelf in our category, anyways. That you know, really, it's all about just giving people the opportunity to sample the product, yeah. and that they can really taste for themselves the so, difference. So I, I was thinking about it. What what is the difference? Like, what's the biggest difference? I mean, you know, those that have tasted it say, you know, wow, this is definitely a superior product. Mm -hmm. But but how do you make it superior to you know other almond butters and nut butters that are out there? Like, I mean, yeah. you don't have to tell us your proprietary secret, but like, <laughs> how do you go about if that? I told you, I'd have to kill you. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's you know that's a great question, and it's one of the things that we consistently have to message because it doesn't really make sense. So we're the only ones that blanch our almonds. We take the skins off before we grind them. Okay. So and when you tell people that, they're like, oh. Okay, well, so what, you know, but you really taste the difference and feel the difference in our almond butter. That's why it's super smooth. Yeah. It has a texture and consistency that is probably more similar to a peanut butter mm. than an almond yeah. butter. People totally. associate almond butter with the skins left on. So it's got that graininess or grittiness that yeah. all the others have. So like when we go talk to a retailer and we're explaining to them why they have to have Barney Butter on the shelf, we always say, you know, your private label, the number one and the number two brands on the shelf are all basically the same product, you know, with minor differences. Hmm. But Barney Butter is completely different. And that's why we've kind of earned our spot on the shelf. And we are a really good complement to all the other SKUs that are sitting on your shelf and there's yeah. a lot of competition. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, there are always new brands coming out and new flavors, that, that sort of thing. So yeah. um, when you can really, you know, develop a unique product that has a loyal following, um, that's a good thing. And also I think people like to do business with businesses, their people behind yeah. them, um, yep. like Barney Butter, instead of just big corporations or big right. co-packers or whatever that are so impersonal. But you know, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you have to go up against those big companies and you have to go, you know, you're fighting, I'm sure for that shelf space. How, how the heck did you do that? Like, how, I mean, I know, again, you have a great product, but how did you sort of get in the ring and spar with the big boys and say, move over a little bit? Cause uh, we have to put our product here. How do you, how do you, how'd you guys right, do that? Yeah. I know it's um, a long-winded question I, and, and I'm sure the answer is pretty extended, but. <laughs> how much time we got? No, um, yeah. <laughs> so, 
You know, when we uh, came into this category 11 years ago, there was the, you know, 800 pound gorilla in the category. And everybody was going after that company to gain market share. And they're owned by a big CPG, a Hmm. publicly held company. And so you had two independently owned brands kind of going after market share. Hmm. And then the um, independently owned company that we were kind of neck and neck with was also acquired by a big CPG. So now you have two big CPGs. And for everybody listening, that means consumer packaged good company. It's the big public companies that mm. you hear about all the time. And then you have Barney Butter. And we're number three in the space. And as you mentioned, you know, the, the other companies have kind of big marketing budgets, big brains, big MBAs. And yeah. um, you're really competing on on a lot and especially budgets and um, just experience. And so, you know, getting back to kind of the whole tasting our product and having a really good product, um, it was always our belief that the more opportunities we could take to have people try our product, um, Mm -hmm. they were gonna continue to buy it. We have some of the highest repeat purchase numbers in the category. So that proves that point for us. And we also kind of had to go about things a different way. I mean, we we didn't have the big budgets to just go on every single store shelf that would take us um, right away. Because in our industry, you have to pay slotting fees to get on those shelves, and that can be quite expensive. And so because we were independently owned and we kind of had to have slower and steady growth, it was a level of discipline, I think, that doesn't necessarily exist across the board, especially when everybody's focused on just top end growth or revenue growth. So we've been focused on healthy growth and building a very healthy business with decent margins and profitability so that we can continue to grow. Um, We've not gone out and taken private equity money or, you know, investment um, like a lot of brands have in order to kind of hit the throttle. Yeah, which is really interesting because today, I mean, everybody's desiring this this quick growth, fast, you know, upward traje- trajectory, and they set they you know the first thing they do is want to raise money as, as they start giving away their company, and then they get upset because they're being told what to do and how to do it. So it's a very this story is a very unique story in today's marketplace. I think so. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's. Um, things have changed, I guess. And and then COVID really kind of came along and changed them even more. Mm. So, you know, when we first got into this business, it was all about kind of riding the ramp, if you will, you know, doubling revenues every single year, which we did for many years. We, you know, started off at 200,000, then we went to 400, then 800, and then a million and a half, and then three. I mean, we rode that ramp where we had 100% growth up to 150% growth year after year. And, um, but it wasn't, when companies were doing that, it wasn't always um, profitable. Margins were always not where they needed to be. EBITDA was not a number that people were really that consumed with. And so, you know, because like I said, our structure and how we're owned, we had to kind of do it differently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then COVID hit, obviously. And so, and the kind of the new um, innovation, if you will, being launched into stores dried up a little bit, because Mm -hmm. who wants to launch a product into a store when people are not walking into the store, right? And walk by and see it and impulse by, you know, so it, so it kind of changed everything. And so I think we're all kind of still calibrating from that and trying to figure out what is kind of the new normal. Yeah. In our place. I, yeah. I was going to ask you that because, you know, if less and less people, even with like Instacart and things like that, less people are browsing, uh, you know, the grocery store shelves, how does a brand like yours that's, you know, that needs people to walk by, touch it, say, you know, I'd like to try that. And now I'm hooked. How do you deal with that now? Like what, what's the, what's a strategy? Cause there's a lot of brands out there that are dealing with a similar situation, you know? I mean, is it more direct to consumer right, model? Right. That, that's not- yeah. Yeah. And then also all the big industry trade shows where mm-hmm. things are typically launched. Yeah. were getting canceled 
or postponed or gone virtual or whatever, you know? Um, but yes, I mean, in my experience, we really had to pivot over the last few years and the companies that were already focused on digital and direct to consumer and had some path that they had already built there are doing all right. Yeah. I think a lot of companies had to scramble if they didn't have that direct to consumer path or, um, or a strong bench internally to handle yeah. digital advertising or programs like, you know, Instacart ads or whatever it may be. So it's shifted a lot from, yeah. and then not to mention kind of the, the meetings that we have with our retailers, right? right. And I used to hop on a plane and fly to wherever, um, Austin or Lakeland, Florida, you know, to, to go meet with a buyer for a 15 minute meeting or a 30 minute meeting. And it was no big deal. Yeah. And now, you know, we've all gotten used to doing this. And, yeah. um, so we've become more efficient. It's, I think it's just as efficient. I, I do miss kind of the, the looking <laughs> somebody in the eye right. in person, right. but, um, but we've all managed to kind of adjust, you know? Yeah. Well, you have to, right? I mean, when your choices are limited, you either yeah. adjust or uh, it's like adjust or, or die. That's the way it works. The brand dies and that's it. But for you, what was your what was your background? I mean, did you have a, a background in consumer goods um, and packaged goods prior to you know embarking on this journey? Um, you know, it's funny because I, I did not. I had a background in manufacturing, but I actually came from technology. Oh. So a lot of the stuff that I'm doing today on the digital front and internet front, that was my background. So, oh, cool. um, so it's funny. I, I was saying to someone the other day, like, I feel like I'm kind of back in my old position because the KPIs that I'm looking at now are very similar. You know, I'm looking at yeah. click through rates, I'm looking at conversions, you know, that sort of thing. And that, that wasn't something that we were focused on six years ago or five mm. years ago, you know, so I came from the internet space. I was in senior management, uh, senior management with careerbuilder.com and orbits.com or okay. two of the and then I ran a subsidiary of a public company in California, which was in the online wagering space. Mm, um, okay. Horse <laughs> racing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, from Kentucky, of course. And yeah. um, that was called ubet.com. And I ran a company called United Tote, which is the the paramutual wagering platform behind that. So when you place a bet on the Kentucky Derby and they give you the odds, that was the company. So. Yeah. No, you yeah. know, so it's, it's cool though to hear where you've come from in your journey. And now here you are, you know, running this, you know, almond butter brand. Yeah. And and it's like how all those experiences come full circle. And here, you know, and, and here you are. So sometimes as you're going through that journey, you're like, you don't really know how it's all going to connect. And now you say, wow, all those skills, all those, you know, uh, all those things that I learned back then, I'm actually applying them now in some way. Yep. That's exactly right. And um, there are things you pick up along the way and you just don't even know where, you know, it's going to take you or, you know, all those times when in your career, when you're like, your path is not 100% clear to you, yeah. but you know, good experience and you're gaining something. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I couldn't be doing what I'm doing today had I not had those roles that I had before, because yeah in every position you pick up something different. I mean, I've worked for certain CEOs that are very finance driven and just 100% data and you have to be really sharp and you have to know your numbers. And, and that was a valuable experience. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've worked with others that are very focused on the consumer experience. And, and so, you know, we use all that here. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, you know, today there's a lot of talk about, you know, um, passion, right? You find your passion and, and you, and you just go with it. You know, I'm guessing for you as a young lady, your passion was an almond butter. Well, um, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say it wasn't almond butter, but I mean, not specifically. So it's funny because, um, my, my grandmother is like, I call her like the natural, the original natural foodie, you know, okay, I mean, okay. she had us eating alfalfa sprouts and everything else from the time that I was a young child. So I've always been passionate about food. I've always been passionate about kind of food as medicine and, 
and eating for health instead of just taste and kind of managing your life through your diet. So I've always been that person. And I think I'm lucky that now I get to do that as, as a career, because when I met my husband in California, when I was running the technology company that I was running, I was in process of getting my yoga certification in my free time. I was making almond butter in my kitchen. And so, um, I was hired in that last job to basically sell it as part of a group of consultants. So I was working myself out of a job and, So my now husband was like, well, what are you going to do after this? You know, you're working yourself out of a job. And, um, you know, I said, you know, I don't know yet, but I'll figure it out. I was talking to a couple of kind of health and wellness companies in Los Angeles at the time. And, and then this Barney Butter thing came, came along and it was a natural fit. And so, you know, my only criteria for kind of choosing my last role was, it has to make the world a better place, whatever product it is. I want it to be a product and it has to improve people's lives, yeah. you know? And, um, and I certainly think Barney Better does that for sure. Yeah. Well, it improves mine every day. I feel like we use it in our smoothies or we, we use it on, uh, you know, as like a topping on, uh, you know, on some toast. So it's, uh, it's working in, the, in that way. How, how big is your team? Um, well, we're a manufacturer, so um, that's a little different in our space because a lot of brands are using co-packers and um, there, are, there are only a couple of us in the space that are also manufacturers. Oh, okay. So we make our product in Fresno, California, which is right in the heart of Almond Alley. And we know all of our growers and our farmers that are right there in our backyard. And so the bulk of our employees actually sit in Fresno. So we have okay. close to 40 employees out there that make the almond butter, ship the almond butter, um, do billing, everything else. And then I have a team of about six people that kind of focus on sales. Well, I mean, sales is a little bit more because it's kind of segmented across the country a little bit, but um, that focus on marketing and finance and reporting and that sort of thing. So it's a small team. We're we're lean and mean for sure. Yeah. We all wear a lot of hats. Um, definitely. But that's, I mean, that's, that's cool. Cause you have a pulse on everything. You, you have a feel for what's going on uh, as opposed to just an expanded team where you're, you know, you, it's very easy to lose that touch and that feel the bigger, the bigger that you get. Yeah. You know that, you know, that book by Malcolm Gladwell, um, Blink. Yeah. Have you read that, you know, he talks about, I think it was Blink. Um, he talks about how it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert in something. Yeah. So we were out for our daily walk with our dog two days ago, maybe. And I was telling my husband, I'm like, you know, it occurred to me, I was thinking about that book the other day and we're experts in this space now without even like trying, you know, I mean, like I started kind of counting the hours and the years we've been at this. And, um, and I'm like, I, I think just by happenstance, we ended up kind of becoming experts in this space, which is really kind of cool. It is cool because, you know, it's such a niched space. I mean, yeah. and you could even niche it down to almond butter, right? We're, we're experts at this. And mm-hmm. what's kind of cool is, you know, really you are. I mean, who knows more about almond butter than you? Well, I will say in that regard, thank you for pointing that out, um, that <laughs> because we only focus on almonds, so a lot of nut butter brands out there have peanut butter, cashew butter, hazelnut butter, whatever. Um, we're almond only. So we make almond butter, almond flour, almond meal, uh, defatted almond butter powder. So we specialize in almonds and we roast our own almonds in house yeah. before we make our product. We grind our own everything. So, so yeah, to that point, um, we know a lot about the whole process in terms of the farming and the water and the agriculture aspect that goes along with it. And so, so I'm with that, how, how do you discipline you know, yourself and all of those folks that want to give you input and say, Hey, well, now that you're in this butter space and you've mm-hmm. shown that you're really good at it, why don't you think about, why don't you think about, and cause I see so many, I, I have this saying, I say, um, early diversification is where, you know, startup yeah. brands go to die. And, and I say that because so many entrepreneurs, they want to do this. They want to do that. They want to do this. How do you stay so focused on just the almonds? 
Um, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> and we talk about that all the time. So it takes discipline because it's, I think it's almost like writing a book or being an author. Like mm. as soon as you get your first one published, everyone starts saying, when are, when's your second book coming out? And yeah. so, you know, I think that there is a lot of pressure, if you will, to come out with a new product and something unique and um, launch new products into another aisle, that sort of thing. Um, so saying no is half the battle because there are a lot of really good ideas out there. Yeah. Um, a lot of really good ideas don't work and don't make it ultimately. And so we, we have been pretty disciplined. Um, we were going to launch a product right before COVID hit. Mm. Um, thank goodness we didn't. It, <laughs> have made it. And, um, and it's really expensive to launch a product. I mean, between yeah. the marketing and the slotting and packaging and R and D and everything else, it's really expensive. So, um, ignoring the, the impulse to come out with a new product, focusing on the white space within your current category, owning that current category, focusing on velocities. Um, you can increase your revenue significantly just by increasing your velocity. Mm -hmm. So getting your product in front of the right people, you know, creating trial, owning every single store. I mean, we're the number one brand in multiple big stores, there are still a bunch of big stores where we need to become the number one brand. Yeah. So until you can do all that, it's almost more of a distraction to be focused on launching another product over here if there's still so much to be done with your core product. Having said that, we probably will launch another product in another category at some time in the near future. Yeah. But there's still a lot of things we can do with our current uh, core SKUs that we have. Yeah. But with that being said, you also have spent what 11 years just focused on your core product, core product offering. Yeah. So, well, we have flour and meal in the baking section, mm. and then we have the defatted almond butter powder. And what we've found is that we make our own almond butter. We, um, we can't do the flour in house because of just the, the dust and everything yeah. that goes along with it. So we can't do that in-house. And we really like um, doing products that we can make in-house for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we just have more control over everything, um, pricing, you know, what it is on shelf, everything else. So, but yes, I mean, that those are very small SKUs and not things that we focus on. We are very, very, very focused on our core products. Yeah. So and um Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to ask you because it's interesting how they're they're not your core product and they're they're these extensions. Does there ever come a point, you know, in in speaking business strategy with you, where you say, "Hey, you know what? It's almost not even worth it to have them because they don't generate enough." I mean, you know, it, as a business leader, as an entrepreneur, how does your mind work to determine if we continue uh, after we've been doing it for a few years? Like, how, how do you make decisions on something like that? We, we talk about that a lot. We're talking about that a lot right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, because it does just become such a small part of your business. And so it, it's something that you can't ignore. No one likes to discontinue a product. Um, you know, we, we launched dip cups and we don't have wide distribution on our dip cups. And we always think about discontinuing them. We probably will uh, at some point in time, but we have a couple of key retailers that really like them and want them. And so it's kind of a rub sometimes when you, you have such a good relationship with your retailers. And if you have a couple of big retailers that really love a particular product, we, we've tended to keep it around for them yeah. and, and not discontinue it. So, but it is a conversation we have, um, it's, it, you have to do it. I mean, we've discontinued flavors and I think that's a really good example of us being kind of disciplined about that because in the beginning, in order to get shelf space, you know, everybody would, almond butter wasn't like quite known yet 11 years ago, you know, it, maybe there were two brands of almond butter on the shelf. Now there's 10 you know? And so in the beginning, in order to get shelf space, every retailer wanted something new and different. Mm -hmm. And so back then we launched four new flavors and 
we had honey and flax, espresso, vanilla, uh, cocoa, coconut, and rot and chia. And they were all delicious. And a lot of retailers were super excited. They brought them in. They're like, oh, we don't have a honey and flax. We don't have one with, with uh, things added to it, like a chia seed or a flax seed. So let's do that. And at the end of the day, those flavors don't sell the same as your regular yeah. non-flavored skews well, because that, that, they're not versatile. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering about that. Cause I'm like, as even as you're saying those flavors, I'm like, oh, those sound really good. I'd love to try them, uh -huh. but I'm always going to go back to the original because it fits what I, you know, how I use it on a day to day. So I, I, that's interesting that, that you brought that up. I was curious to see if, if even after all those new, you know, flavors, if people still went back to just the original. Yeah, they do. Um, we always say like, vanilla, 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 you know, in the ice cream category, yeah. it's always yep. vanilla. In the almond butter category, it's about smooth regular you know yeah. and, and and actually our bear smooth is a top performer and that has no sugar or salt added so okay. that's been kind of a shift i think from the consumer um over the last five years really focused on no added sugar or salt which is quite interesting but um yeah, it's hard to find because everything everything you touch today you have to really you know uh, scan it for added sugar added salt i mean i know myself when i go to a store that's the first thing I look for. How much sugar, how much salt? That's and right. It's, it's a, you know, everything is so driven today by sugar and salt. People mm -hmm. are driven by sugar and salt, I should say. I do the same thing. And like when you try to do the whole 30 or something like that, you yeah, really yeah. become hyper aware of it because there, there's no wiggle room there. It's like no sugar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And the yeah. first few days on something like that are very challenging. And then your body starts to say, okay, I'm, I'm okay. And then after 30 days, when you have something with sugar and salt, you're like, ooh, that doesn't taste that good. That's exactly right. Well, even our regular, we only add a couple grams of sugar. So it's not like really super sweet. It's just yeah. enough. And, um, you know, because of the texture, obviously, it, it's very similar to peanut butter. And because peanuts, they don't grind peanuts with skin on, right? So that, that's why the, the texture is similar. But I think that's why kids like the, the product so much, too. Yeah. You know? That's why I like the product. It's very, I like, I like the smooth. Yeah, exactly. It's true. It's true. I like the big, I like, I like the smooth nature to it. That's what really attracted me. And, and it's easy to spoon out. It's just, it's got a lot of positives that, that you don't even know why they're positive. That's why I asked like, Hey, what's the secret? So, so I'm, I'm happy you shared that with us, but I wanted to ask you just as a, as a business leader, um, what are some of your biggest challenges that you face in, in leading a company. And I know that your company is, it, I mean, it's spread out, you know, from where things are manufactured to where you live to where the rest of the team may be. How do you, you know, what are some of your great challenges as a, as a leader in today's marketplace? Well, I mean, this may not be exactly what you're asking, but I think our biggest struggle right now is supply chain stuff, you know, mm, okay. and um, not that, Nothing we buy is coming, you know, from a foreign country on a container. I mean, we are made in the USA. Our almonds are grown in the USA. But our biggest struggle is getting our product on the shelf mm. at a price that is palatable for the consumer. Almonds are already expensive, right? Yeah. And um, so our big struggle for 11 years has been, how do you make the best product on the shelf which also costs the most to make because it costs 50 cents a pound to blanch almonds. Mm. So we're already the most expensive um, from a quality standpoint. How do you make that affordable to the consumer so that they can buy our product? And I would say that's our number one challenge as, as a company. And when almond prices go up, um, you know, our margins get compressed and yeah. we don't make money and, you know, we have employees that we have to pay and everything else. So, you know, getting that price um, to a point where the consumer doesn't feel like they have to buy peanut butter this week or something else is, is our biggest challenge. And then, so right now um, we took a price decrease last year mm. because almond prices came down. So we actually took a price decrease and as soon as that decrease started going into the system and hitting store shelves, 
all the distributors started doing price increases because of supply chain issues. Okay. So if it's not one thing, it's another, right? So, yeah. um, so I think that's the biggest challenge. I think from a business standpoint is managing that because there's, there's a lot that goes into just making the jar of almond butter at the plant and then it getting to the store shelf. It's more than just us dealing with the retailer. Yeah. You know, the retailer has their arrangement with a distributor. They pay a certain price to them. And so a lot of times we just don't have total control. Yeah. And, total you know, as, as a consumer, you know, a lot of consumers take for granted that process. They just go to the store and see it there. But I, I mean, for me, I've always said every product here has a story as to how they got here. And it's not, and now we're learning, hey, it's not as easy to get product onto the shelves as, uh, you know, as it may appear. That's right. That's right. And I will say one thing that I'm really proud of is during that whole COVID period, we shipped 100% on time and full across the board. Um, and our plant, the people that work there and support this brand did such an amazing job in making sure that that happened. And we kept product on the store shelves during that entire period of time. So um, we're really lucky that we have long-term employees that have been with us the entire 11 years. I mean, yeah. it's, we have a lot of loyalty in our plant. We don't have a lot of turnover. Um, so we have all that institutional knowledge and commitment to making a great product and getting it out the door. So that, that's one, one concern or headache I don't have, thank yeah. goodness. Because yeah. I know that that's a struggle for a lot of companies and brands right now. And we've, we've been very lucky in that way that we don't yeah. have that <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. You need a, a loyal team to help you uh, to help you make it happen. As it relates to, I was going to ask you, as it relates to your own personal development and personal growth as a, you know, as an individual and as a leader, how do you continue to develop yourself? Or is it just, you know, hey, every day I suit up to do this, I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm going into waters that I haven't been in before. Like if someone at your level, how do you continue to grow yourself? Yeah. Um, well, I'm an advisor for a couple of different brands. And, mm. and I think that that's great because I'm learning by working with them on their brand and mm. them asking me questions and me thinking through, okay, well, this may be a different category or something else, but they have different problems than maybe I've had. So if I experience a problem through them, and then I anticipate the same, you know, I have the same one in my own business Then I've learned, right? Yeah. But I think, you know, one thing that's changed for me is I used to read like all the time. I used to always have a book going and now I listen to a lot of podcasts. Okay. So I, it's like a multitasking thing, you know, yeah. so I'll go for a walk, but I'll listen to a podcast and, and, um, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people from the food space, um, that have shared their stories, um, a lot of authors who have written books in this space, like Ramping Your Brand. And mm. um, so a lot of podcasts. And then I have a lot of friends in the space uh, that yeah. I've created over the years as well. And just having access to other people that have been there and done that. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard if you don't have that as a resource and you can't ask questions and and get input from other people that have the same experience as you, yeah. right? So, yeah, that's that's I always say. You know, when I work with sales teams, I always say, hey, you know, as you become a more veteran member of the team, you're going to be able to just pick up your phone or shoot an email to somebody to make something make something happen. You know, there's there there may be somebody that's uh, you know just getting started in in creating a brand now that that comes across this. How do you get started today? Like, I mean, what's, I mean, if you, if you don't have the, the network connections and, you know, what, what would you, your advice be to somebody just getting started today that's looking to, you know, dominate a niche like, like you are? Yeah. Well, I think you need to have a war chest, <laughs> obviously, um, and, and a lot of passion. Um, but I think above anything, you need to have a good product. And, yeah. You know, it's, I don't think it's enough just to be unique or a little different. It needs to be a great product. It needs to taste really good. I mean, there are a lot of things, you know, it's, it's great if it's better for you or if it's keto or 
paleo friendly or whatever any of the certifications are. And um, that's all wonderful. But if it doesn't taste good, mm. then people aren't going to buy it again and again and again. And it's really hard to get a customer to try your product one time. So if you get them, you want them to continue to buy your product. So make sure it's a product somebody wants to continuously buy. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that's half the battle. And then, you know, I, I would say my biggest learning or, um, mistake or something I wish I would have done differently is very early on, I would have formed an advisory board for this Mm. company. And I didn't do that for one reason or another. Um, And it doesn't need to be like even a formalized board with equity or, you know, paying people, just an advisory board of people that you can reach out to. Um, We kind of just went it alone in the beginning. And I would, I would say, find people that you like, find people that are willing to talk to you, that like to talk to you, that like developing other people and learn from them because it took us a long time to figure out what we did not know in this space. You know, I mean, that, that whole thing is, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know, and then you know what you don't know kind of thing. And it takes a long time to get to that second level and don't go it alone. You know, you, you know that it's a great point because you know today um, everybody also thinks that they have to pay for advisory. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's a lot of people out there. I mean, you can go on LinkedIn. You can go, you know, your folks in your community that just want to help. Like, like they love business. They may have had quite a bit of success, and they enjoy helping people. So it's a it's a great point. I I, I know that there's a lot of people though that listen and say it's great, but why would they want to work with me? you know, why would they want to help us? Like we're too small for, you know, and everybody waits for this perfect either revenue number or size before they feel like they, you know, would be eligible for a board or advisory, but I'm sure. I've never said no whenever anybody's reached out to me and asked a question or asked if they can pick my brain. And, and I'm sure there are people out there that would say no, I don't know, but I, I think that this is a small world, if you will, in terms of founders and people that run brands and, and it's just nice to help people. It's like you're elevating the entire space. If you help somebody else that, you know, ends up succeeding. Um, so why not? You know, I mean, we, we're all in the same natural stores. We're all shooting for the same thing. We all have the same core values. I would think, I mean, if you're launching a product, that's a better for you product, you probably have very similar values in that way. So there are probably a lot more similarities than differences between all of these people. So I think that, like you said, I think there's a real willingness out there. Yeah. And it's just, don't, don't be afraid to ask. And and there is no perfect moment to ask. Just ask when you feel you need help, you ask. That's exactly (laughs) It's yeah, like, no, it's, I'm, I'm not afraid to ask for help. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's also, um, I always find too, one of the great qualities to, to building anything great is you have to have an openness. Mm-hmm. So if you're, if you're somebody that's open to asking, you have an openness and you have a willingness to, to, you know, get what you want and, and, you know, you're, it's like universe, I call it universal law. If you ask for something, you'll get it, you know, but you can't be afraid to ask because you okay. got to keep in that in and tight. It's like, oh. Oh. I'm always surprised that more people don't, right? Like what, what's the worst thing that could happen? Yeah. And well, today, I mean, I, I see it a lot. You know, if you, you know, everybody wants to, there's not everybody, but there's a lot of folks that feel like they have to pay for advisory, um, but they don't. And, you know, I, what, some of my favorite thing, one of my favorite things to do in addition to this show is like just meeting people um, in my travels that, that maybe they're retired for the last 10, 15 years, but Hey, tell me about your journey. And people love to share. And that's a, that's how you grow. It's like you, when I asked you how you develop yourself, a lot of it is going to other people so they could share. That's right. That's Very right. powerful. I currency. See, I see a book in your future uh, compiling all these stories. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I have thought about that. I have two books already, but, um, which I'm going to send you, but, um, oh, but, uh, but compiling the stories of the journey and all these great people that, that I come across, it's amazing. The learning is, is tremendous. And that's why I do the show. Cause I, I enjoy taking one person's story and sharing it with a bunch of other people so that they yeah. can grow back. 
and it's just a very cool brand spread and I've introduced people to people and, and it's a very uh, fun thing. But I have one last question for you. I call it the Becoming a Champion show and I feel like we're all on this journey to become a champion, champion self, um, champion companies. What does the word champion mean to you? Oh boy, you would think I would have thought about this before I agreed to get uh, on this with it's you. It's okay. Right? <laughs> yeah, there's no, well, here's the best part. There's no wrong answers. I know, I know. <laughs> you know what? I, I mean, I, I said, I'm a goal setter, you know? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I wear my Apple watch and yeah. I know exactly how many minutes a day on each level for everything. And you know, um, becoming a champion to me, I think is, it's nobody else's bar. It's your own internal bar that you have to achieve. And it's not like a long-term one thing for me. It's like a daily, weekly, monthly feeling good about myself and feeling yeah. like I did the best that I could do on any given day. And in terms of output and yeah. commitment and showing up and um, delivering on what I've committed to. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know, that may be quite simple, but- um, Well, I think, I actually think it's great because you know, for, for some people, they don't know what's enough, when's enough, what's what, did I do my best? So for you, it sounds like you have a process that allows you to say, hey, I, I did what I had to do for today. That That's exactly right. And, um, but I think the biggest thing is, this is like throughout my career, I've kind of, I've told people this, um, is just showing up, saying yes, and 80% of success is showing up or whatever that expression is. Yeah, yeah, it's a good quote. It's true. You know, I mean, you just have to be there, be present and, and show up. And, so. and it sounds like with that philosophy too, and, and it's like for you, it sounds like it's just been success over time. There's no, you're not sprinting and, and, you know, trying to set a, a record today. It's saying, Hey, if we keep doing this over time, we're going to win. We're going to do really well. It's consistency, right? And yeah and constant attention to your metrics and what's important because mm -hmm. I don't think most of the time you see an overnight success, right? right? Um, there's, there are all kinds of brands in our space that people read about that have had these huge exits, like, you know, ridiculous multiples of revenue or EBITDA or whatever it may be. And they appeared to be overnight successes. But yeah. when you really look at it, it was years and years and years and years of discipline and doing the right thing. And then mm -hmm. um, what it, what's the expression, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yep. It just so happens that you've put in all this preparation and then you happen to get this opportunity and boom, success. But had you not done all that preparation, it wouldn't have resulted the same way. Yeah. So, all that chopping wood every day, just chop, 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 chop. And eventually, you know, you get that tree falling moment, but you know, yeah. it's, um, it sounds like for you, you, you're enjoying the journey of it. Uh, there's hurdles, there's obstacles, which the competitor in you probably enjoys overcoming and, and the brand continues to grow and continues to move forward. Uh, yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. cool. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, we love it. We're passionate about it and it's, it's our baby and um, truly, I think the best product on the shelf. And I agree. I'm with you on that. hundred yeah. percent. Well, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah. And I'm probably going to send you a box of goodies as well. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode as much as I did. It's uh great to see somebody that says they want to be the best at something. And for Dawn, that something was almond butter. But my question is for you, what do you want to be the best at? What do you want to be known for? What are you the best at? And that's what you should focus on. That's the lane that you should work to dominate. And too many times we go left, we go right, we listen to this person, we listen to that person, and it gets us in trouble. So you got to focus on what it is that you want to be great at. And usually, it's a niche. It's very small. And you can dominate that niche. And I had a client tell me one time, he said, coach, never forget this, but the riches are in the niches. And today we learned how almond butter could provide a lot of riches. And when you stay in your lane and you put those 10,000 hours in, you could become the best. And that's what Dawn Kelly did. And that's what you're going to do. So remember the importance of staying in your lane, 
and being the best at something. Every day, commit to being the best. Hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Becoming a Champion show. And if you did, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, comment down below, and we'll see you next week with another great show. See ya.